current district, I have, you know, six schools. So, uh, you know, what, are, there, are there seven here? Okay. So I will go in on my calendar and, and I, will, I will schedule those. And the other thing that uh, be, because evaluating principals is, is part of my responsibility in providing coaching and feedback to, to those folks, uh, I, I kind of double dip there. So I, I, it allows me to be in the building to, um, um, to not, I don't want to say supervise, but, but to coach and have conversations with, with my principal to help him grow or her grow as, as a leader. But it also allows me time, opportunities to pop into classrooms and, um, and that kind of thing. And, that, and that's what I like to do. You know, I, I used to try to do like the, the formal walkthroughs and things of that nature, but I, I really like it when I can go into a classroom and, and, and teachers don't feel stressed. They, you know, they just, they just know I'm there because I want to see what's going on. I like, I like to hang out with kids and that kind of thing. So, so right now, and again, you know, I, I've got it pretty good because all my schools are very, very close together. So I've got like this little route that I take. I start this school and, until I get them all done and I get, and get back to my office. Um, and again, um, some, sometimes it, it can be intentional if I have to do walkthroughs, if, I, if I'm with our, our leadership team and, and we're doing walkthroughs and we're looking for particular things. Uh, but sometimes it could be just out of a supervisory thing. For instance, like making sure that uh, you know, as I walk the halls with my, with my principals to make sure that uh, if there are people in their supervisory capacities, what, what the plan says they're supposed to be, and, uh, and, and reminding uh, him or her about, you, you know, why we have to follow, you know, what is, you know, what, what we've, what the board has approved and what they have turned into the board. Uh, and again, like I said, and in, in, in most cases, I'm just popping out there, just building relationships and getting to know, uh, you know, my, my folks. Um, and, and that's, and, and again, that's, that's probably my, my favorite part of that. Well, here, here's the, the I, th I think, the, the difficult part about communication. It's very easy uh, to, to get out one-way communication where, where I, as the leader of, of, of the district or leader of a school, I, I get stuff out to the parents, I get stuff out to the community, but the tricky part is allowing them to communicate back with us, that two-way communication. And, you know, I've tried that with, with, with social media, and then sometimes, you know, you know, people can, can be a little uh, cantankerous and, and, and things like that. So it turns out to not be very productive. So um, I think, I mean, one of the things I do right, right now currently in terms of communication, and, and my communication is, is daily, and it just depends on, on who I'm trying to reach and, and who, the, who the target audience is. But uh, so, you know, I do a, I mean, every day, uh, I haven't done it yet today because I've been on the road, but every day I, I do an attendance update with, with all of, uh, with, with, with the entire staff and the board, letting them know what, what that looked like each day. Because again, uh, you know, at the top of my newsletter that goes out every Friday, the, the first thing is attendance matters. And so if it's going to matter, then, then, you know, we, we, um, we address that every, every day. And then, uh, so it allows, you know, schools to celebrate those things that, that they're doing well to get kids to school. Uh, so, so that you know the, the daily uh, email regarding attendance, the weekly newsletter, and the weekly newsletter just has a hodgepodge of, of things. Uh, again, attendance right now, you know, legislative updates. You know what's going on with the legislature. Uh, what uh, you know, what what does the the budget bill look like? Uh, you know, are there possibilities for salary increases? And then also the community connection because with with us as well, or any really any school district. You know, we, we want to bridge that gap between our schools and, and the community. We want the community to feel like that uh, they are they are part of, of what's going on. They they are genuine stakeholders as well. Uh, so again, so part of that communication is uh, whenever I have opportunity, like at uh, Rotary or Chamber of Commerce in, in my small town, uh, I invite our our students, teachers, district leaders to come in and present to to uh, to those folks. Uh, you guys have have, and I don't want to get it wrong. Ours is ours is a learner profile. Yours is a profile of a graduate, right? Okay. So so we so we we're we're in the second year of that. We really haven't rolled it out completely. It's been like a three year process. Next year would be year three, but and probably this, you guys probably did the same thing. 
so we we incorporated a stakeholder input from the community and allowed and, and so some of that was our you know our our rotary group and so with rotary we, we have been able to to share with them along the way how this thing has, has progressed so that they could see from start to finish and then the role they played in, in the the midst there uh you know, some of, the, some of the things I mentioned in here, because I do think it's important, based on what, what I read about uh, about Oxford, um, people want to see the superintendent out in the community. They want to they want that person to be visible. And again, that, that is something that I hold myself accountable to right now, visible, approachable, accessible. Um, and one of the things that, that I, I teach uh, my principals. So find, you know, figure, just figure out a way to, to get out into the community uh, to get out to those places, um, hopefully be a member of of chamber of commerce, uh, our chamber of commerce and Rotary and, and those other civic groups um, to, to make to make that connection. Um, I feel like I'm rambling a, a little bit, but but that but that's a uh, um, but so I, it, I really try very 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 hard. Uh, to be a, a good communicator, but I, I think communication is one of those things. No matter how much you have, or how often you do it, it's never enough, and it's and it's not enough. It's just one of those things that we just have to keep working on. And again, my my thing, and I think I've included that in here, is is somehow to create a a, a uh, transparent two way plan of communication, so that everybody's involved and, and everyone uh, has a um, has a voice. So the next question really talks about how would you achieve transparency and build trust across the district and the community? I think you covered that okay. and, and stuff, unless there's anything else you wanted to add. I might, something might pop up here in a minute. Okay. But okay. If that's okay, we come you back. You can always circle back to that. All right. So, I appreciate, I appreciate so that. So going on changing gears a little bit. All right. How do you handle difficult conversations with stakeholders? I hit them head on. But but here's here's what has to happen, and, and, this, and I learned this as, as a teacher, uh, that uh, it's a very important to me to build relationships and um, and to build trust with, with with those folks. So I learned as a teacher that if I if I built that relationship and that child knew that I cared about them as an individual, then if I ever had to have a difficult conversation, uh, I, I could. They might not like it, but they still knew that Mr. Raleigh liked them and loved them. Uh, and so I, I kind of carry that that same philosophy in, into into leadership uh, because uh, sometimes you know uh, adults do stuff that. Um, you know that they wish they hadn't, and they're they're sorry about it, and wish they could take it back. So I try, I try to show them I try to show them some grace. And, and there's three so there's three things that that uh, that I, I tell my folks. You've got my full support, but you have to pass the the litmus test of three things. Number one, what you do cannot be detrimental to the to the well-being, emotional, physical, or social well-being of a child. Okay, that's number one. Secondly, you can't break the law, and third. You can't violate board policy. If you haven't done any of those things, then you, you have my full support, right? But if, if if I have to, I hit it head on. And again, my hope is that I've, and again, and they're not going to be always be happy with it, but I've had teachers and, and other folks that have, that have thanked me, thanked me for treating them with dignity, allowing them to, you know, to leave the, the conversation with, with, with their dignity and respect. And uh, that's something that I pride myself on. But again, because again, I, I want to be treated uh, how I'd want somebody to treat me. We all mess up, uh, but that doesn't mean that that you know people give up on us. So I hit them head on. Uh, again, uh, if if it's if it's school related, I always bring it back to uh, policy, or because that way it takes the emotion out of it, and it's all based on you know here here are the facts. As a matter of fact, while I was on my way up here, got a text about something that happened. Somebody violated the policy, and that's what I get to deal with at 18 in the morning when I get back to Kentucky. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. And, and let me say this also about building relationships in, in the trust thing. And this is what I know and this is what I understand. Uh, and it doesn't matter if, like, if I'm in Kentucky and I, and I just go from one county to the next. Those people don't know me. And just like these folks up here would not know me. And although I know that I'm a trustworthy person, and I think that you should trust, you should trust me, you have to see demonstrated performance. And, you've got, and that does not happen overnight. So that's one of those things that would fall on me in terms of my, you know, my, uh, my morals and my character and, and the way that, that I, I conduct myself. Uh, and so that's what, that's what I would do to build that trust and in turn that builds those relationships. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, I'm next. Um, I'm going to talk to you about student achievement. Yes, ma'am. Okay, what are the most important areas in which the Oxford Community Schools should invest time and money to ensure student success? Okay, um, based on, uh, and, and again, uh, I have not been able to to get to dig into the weeds. I did get on on the Michigan uh, school report card, and, and uh, I was looking for kind of a, a snapshot of, of the entire district, but it didn't look like I could do that. So I had to do individual schools. It was taking me some time. But one of the things that I did look at, and this is one of the things that we we paid attention and shared the data with uh, at our district recently, <clears throat> were the uh, uh, the reading and math recovery rates since since uh, since COVID. Um, Typically, the, the, in, in my district, we, we're, we're on our way or trending up. Most other, I shouldn't say most, the, the districts that I have looked at are trending on the way up. Um, Oxford, the, the math was slightly, maybe 0.04, uh, trending up in, in terms of the math, but I think reading is still uh, downward. So those would be the two areas that, that I think that I would invest the most attention and, and resources to and seeing what we, can we, and I think I've, I, and I may have taken that out because I thought it was too specific, but that was one of the things that I thought if that, if, if I got the job, one of the first things that I would do uh, in, in my transition plan was to, to meet with the, and I don't know what the, the exact title is, but I just referenced it as the uh, superintendent of curriculum instruction assessment, but just to get with that person to, to maybe do some root cause analysis to see what was, uh, you know, what, what, what's going on, what's taking place, and see if we can't get that turned around. Okay, next one, still for me. Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you see being the biggest challenges for student achievement in Oxford? Yeah, well, and, and again, the challenges that Oxford has are no different than, than most districts um, around the, the country. It's, isn't it, it kind of odd that no matter, you know, kids are kids, and no matter where, where you go, no matter where the, the county lines are or the state lines are, the kids are kids, and it just seems like, you know, in, in every uh, uh, every county, every state, you know, we're struggling to get kids to school since the pandemic. Um, math and literacy, even before the, the pandemic, uh, has, has been a um, has been an issue. And, and those are two things. Those are two areas that that have to be addressed because, ultimately, I mean, those are the those are the, the foundations that kids build upon as they go from one one uh, uh, level to the next. Um, so that would be the, now the challenge there is, again, that root cause analysis, what's, what's the, as we drill down, what, what is, what is causing, uh, the kids at Oxford not, not to, uh, not to make those same kind of, um, gains post pandemic that, that other schools are. And I couldn't answer that really without getting into more data and getting into classrooms and having conversations with, uh, with, with the, the appropriate stakeholders, uh, in, in the, uh, in the district. So could you tell uh, me how you envision as a superintendent here in Oxford that you would be able to bring together parents, community, those organizations that you talked about to create a healthy and safe learning and working environment? I, I, I think first and foremost, I just have to reach out. I just have to in, in meet them on, on their terms. Um, and I, I think I did mention mention in here kind of an example. I mean, I uh, was maybe um, in terms of community members and parents, you know, maybe having I didn't know what really what to call it, but like a, a coffee talk, you know, something that takes place, you know, after after they drop their their, their children off and they want to meet at a local coffee shop. I, it's my understanding that there are multiple ones around here, right? Okay, so we, we wouldn't, you know, we would we could we could spread the wealth, you know, kind of a deal. Uh, and so offer opportunities like, like that, and but also opportunities for uh, for them to come to to the schools. And, and again, I don't know what that situation is like now. I, I, you know, with um, with with all the safety measures and things of that nature. I don't know. Uh, I, I know that in, in our district, and we have not experienced anything like you have. Uh, but um, uh, but school safety was when I first got to uh, to Liberty County, and, and our strategic plan, school safety was is one of our main components. So we are we are uh, um, more secure than than we ever have been. The, the, that's 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 a positive. But on the flip side, I get parents complaining that it's not very welcoming, it's not very inviting, and so that that's why I say maybe maybe meet them somewhere else. But maybe 
offer opportunities, provide opportunities. If, if uh, you know, if you go through, I don't know whether you have to do the, the Raptor system like we use or some kind of background check to allow uh, parents and community members into the schools. I'm sure you do you do that. Or, you know, we, we allow people to come in and, and read and, and things of that nature. Um, but um, um, that, that, I mean, that's where I'd start, I'll, meeting them here but also meeting them on their on their own turf, and if and if and that's the thing. If the coffee talks doesn't doesn't work, then maybe we do it after school. Uh, maybe it's it, it, it's at a church or or a, or, or some other um, civic center or something like that. That's the, again, it's kind of a, a neutral court uh, kind of a thing. Because I know lots of folks don't want to come to schools because maybe when they were in school, uh, they had a negative experience with school. So. Uh, just thinking about going into a school gives them the heebie-jeebies anyway. So trying to you know find a, a place where, where they feel comfortable. Uh, but I would you know I would um, one of the first things I would do is is to get an idea of who those groups are and, and, and kind of work work my way out because you probably have parent groups at each of the schools where there be PTOs and PTAs and, and booster clubs and and things of that nature where you've got the same people that are always there but then also start to try to work you know work your way out because one of the things that that I saw. And his comments, and again, these these are, these are perceptions, but that y you know people feel disconnected. They feel that there's a a lack of of transparent communication. So, and and I'm not here to tell you that that you're ever going to get 100 percent on that because there's always going to be somebody that that's that's upset. But the idea would would be to continuous improvement and to keep moving forward on that. Great. So, could you tell me a little bit about how you would work uh, collaboratively uh, between uh, administrators and teachers to create um, to get work accomplished between administrators and teachers mm -hmm. okay well and uh, I would um, and again I can't remember if it's in here or not. It, it may be I, I can't remember everything I put in and some of the stuff that I, that I tuck out but one of the things that I would I want to do is to take a look at what your your evaluation system looked like what your evaluation process looked like um, you know what? 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 And I, I apologize. Uh, I, I don't know what standards uh, Michigan uses, but uh, you know what? Uh, you know what your uh, what your what your standards are. Your your teaching standards, your learning standards, and then um, and that's what I do right now with 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 with, with my, my all my principals are, are fairly fairly young, and the the idea ab about having evaluations and observations and things of that nature is is not to be punitive, but for um, continuous improvement kind of a deal um, but sometimes folks they fall back on what what they recall when, when they were a student uh, and, and what you know or, or, or when they were teaching and what they saw and what the principal did so that's kind of what they revert back to but what what I try to do is to stay focused on what is the stand just just like I talked a while ago about holding people accountable to you know like if, if you if you mess up I'm gonna I'm gonna connect it back to a, a policy, and that's what we're going to have a conversation about. So we're going to take away all the all the personal stuff and all the emotions that's going to be based on that. Well, same thing with with standards. You know, if I go into a classroom and a teacher is teaching a certain content area, then it should be aligned. It should be congruent with 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 that standard. And so, same thing with 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 my principals. Everything that 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 all the evidence that I collect on them, or the evidence that I ask of them, is congruent with what those standards are. So I would try to help make those connections that here, here's how I'm evaluating you. And that's what I tell them. I tell them that my job is to make them better, make them better instructional leaders, because I need them to create better uh, classroom leaders, other teachers, that in turn make better learners. And so it's all kind of a trickle-down effect. So if, so if I don't do my job, then they can't do their job effectively and, and, and vice versa. So it's just about that, having that, that, that attitude of continuous improvement. And, um, and I, I think one of, my, one of my core beliefs, you know, I talk about the, you know, the teacher effectiveness and, uh, and how important that is in, in improving instruction, but also allowing teachers to um, have conversations with their peers. And, and um, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, even in our district, you know, I, I tell our folks, you know, that they, they want to go outside the district to observe somebody else, and we've got excellent 
instruction going on right there. We don't, all we got to do is, you know, pay for a sub and, and, and we'll let you go across the road and, and visit good instruction. And so probably the same thing is, is going on here. But, and again, I don't know what the culture's like. I'd have to see that. And that comes, and, you know, culture's one of those things you don't, you don't change overnight. It's just about what we do every day is part of our, our DNA and uh, just making people, you know, understand that, um, you know, we, we're, my job is, is to is to make principals better. Principals' jobs are to make teachers better. Teachers' jobs are to make students better. So I don't, I don't know. Did that? Do you need some clarification, or do I need no. to? Okay. All right. Um, what is what would you say your leadership philosophy is for other work groups for collaboration? So outside of teachers, like classified or or, or support staff. I'm, support it, staff, janitors, bus drivers, food service workers. So my folks will tell you that uh, you, you know, I started off this my you know in my introduction as I was an instructional assistant. Uh, the reason that's important is because I'm able to build relationships with all those folks. They are all important and, and valued by me, and, and that is the uh, uh, the message that that we send. So, and again, one of those things to to so so that it uh, um, it, it is equal. In terms of creating like like focus groups, that would be one of those those things about communication and, and getting getting feedback from others and being transparent and that kind of thing. Well, um, the support staff and I, what, is that the is that the same uh, language that you guys use? Support, yeah. Classified support. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. They call classified in our district, but we've changed that to support because classified just seems so uh, I don't know dull. Um, and so we, you know, they, they really provide um, a great service. So they're valued, and it, even to the point, let me give you an excellent example. Uh, so when I first got to LaRue County, I had these focus groups, and um, prior to me getting there, and most districts probably do, they, they had a, a program where they recognized, you know, teacher of the year kind of a deal, right? So when, when I was had my um, support staff focus group together, and listening to them, they said, you know, we, we would like to be recognized, you know. And so I didn't know that they didn't do that. Now, in Kentucky, we, we call it the Fred Award. I don't know if you guys heard of Fred Sanborn, the Fred Factor, that book? Okay. It's anyway, Fred, the Fred Factor is, is, is about somebody that goes above and beyond. If you've ever read the book, uh, uh, Mike, uh, Mark Sanborn wrote, wrote this book about his, his mailman. And he just goes, his name's Fred, he just goes above and beyond. So in Kentucky, we, we have the Fred Award. So, it's, so every, every summer nat or statewide, there's, there's one selected. We actually had one from Liberty County a few years ago. But we, um, we do it at the, at the local level where every school is represented, every department's represented, and they didn't do that before. So, so just, just last week, uh, last Monday night, actually, or the, it was a week ago Monday, I just gotten home when, when I got the, the phone call from uh, to invite me to the uh, interview. I just gotten home from that, so we recognized our our four uh, teachers, teacher from each school, uh, the teacher winners, and then all eleven of our representatives of our what we call our, our Fred Award. So, um, now in terms of collaboration, it, it's just it's just an expectation that um, that they be valued and treated like everybody else. Um, and, and I can I can say that with 100 percent certainty because I just yesterday morning I had breakfast with one of our uh, McDonald there in in, in uh, Hodgenville with with one of our custodians at um, from the high school, and uh, that was his concern about me leaving. You, you know, are, are they going to be able to find somebody that 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 you know values us like like you do? And I said, well, I, I think I think they probably will. Yeah, so um, so I know that I know that that is that they know that. Uh, and they know that when, you know, that uh, another example I would give you is that, um, you know, when I first got there, um, bus driver pay was, was very low. And all of our support staff was, pay was very low. And we eventually, I spent the first three or four years giving, doing nothing but increasing those, those salaries to get those folks up to where, not, not where they, they, still very below where they need to be, but better than where they were. And really didn't give teacher raises until um, COVID when we when we had the extra money. Thank you. So as you can imagine, um, our student staff and community are still deeply affected by the school shooting of 2021. What experiences, philosophy, or trainings do you have in the following areas: school safety, trauma-informed care, 
crisis management and policy management? Um, spe specifically, policy management. I mean, I mean, in terms of of just writing Your policy. Philosophy on on policy management. Oh, oh, I, I, I follow you now. I I think I've alluded to that a little a little bit ago. Um, I cannot tell you the number of times that that, and we'll start with that one. Because uh, again, I, I just believe that it's, um, and I, I get it. There's there's lots of policies there, but uh, that doesn't mean that that um, that they're not reviewed and, and they're not followed. Um, I can't tell you the number of times where a principal will call me and say, "Can we do this?" And do you know what my question to them is? I could tell them yes or no, but do you know what my question, my my, my response to them is, "What does the policy say?" Re refer to the policy. As a matter of fact, I think one year I did like a. Um, because I, this this was like a, a retreat I did with our leadership staff. We had like we had like a policy, um, uh, what do you call those things? Um, scavenger hunt. Yes, where where they had to go through and find the the things that popped up a, a lot. You know, so 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 managing policy is it's not a it's, it's not an option. It's an expectation. Okay, so that's so in terms of being trained on that, it's just it's just more of. No matter where I've been, even even as a principal, there was district policy. Uh, as a as a principal, we you know we had our, our site based council policy. That's 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 what we follow. We don't go rogue. You know we, we we do what the policy says. And again, as you guys know very well, I've had this conversation with with our with our a brand new principal. You 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 have to follow what the policy says, and you cannot get complacent. You cannot get lazy. Um, and I have not had to deal with with the um, issues as severe as what you guys have, but I have had to deal with issues where, like for instance, there was a fight in a in a bathroom, and a kid got hurt, and the parent was suing us, and the insurance company uh, wanted to see those documents, and so we, we we had you know we had that document that showed what what the supervision schedule was. And that you know, we we had evidence to show that, that person was there. So that, those are things I try to get across to our, you know, to to our our um, uh, our young leaders that that stuff. Matt, it's not just to, to you know you just don't you know mark it off. That, that, yeah, oh yeah, we have that. It's it's about adhering to it. Uh, in terms of crisis management, I've had to deal with, with that. Again, not to the extreme that you guys have. Not not at all. But in, in my district, in the six years I've been there, we've had several <clears throat> student deaths. Um, the death of parents, um, staff death, just, m just really more than than, um, than than the average school district would, and so we, you know, we we have a crisis management team in in place, um, but we're also able to um, uh, to call upon the help of our um, our educational cooperative, where they can, you know, send folks, uh, counselors, and other mental health professionals up to. To help us out with that, so and we again we we created a uh, a policy for that. Uh, we, we had to because um, in in terms of people wanting to memorialize, you know, someone every time someone passed away, we had to, we had to get a policy in place. Um, um, trauma informed care. I'm I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be honest with you. I've had probably the the trauma informed care overview. I have not been trained in detail. It's my understanding that that's a lengthy process, maybe five days or so, something like that. Because you, because you're probably referring to like what CDC, those those six components of, of trauma informed care. So I have not had that. Have have I been versed on trauma informed care? Has my staff been trained? Again, not not to the extent probably that your staff has, but yes, we're very familiar with that. Um, and let's see, you asked me about another one, I think. School safety. School safety, y yes. Um, as assistant superintendent in another district, that was, that, was my, um, that was my role as to oversee school safety. And, and as I said, uh, when I became superintendent in, in LaRue County, that was one of the, and, and that, wasn't my, that wasn't my thing. That was based on everything that was going on in the, in the world. Our, our parents and community were, were concerned, and so that became a component, and, and that's how we got so many things done because that was part of that, that strategic plan. So, um, and, and again, e even though we, um, we we have that stuff implemented, we don't. We, it, it's not a compliance thing. We hold people accountable. 
you know, we, we hold people accountable to closing doors, not putting rocks, leaving rocks in doors to leave an exterior door open and that kind of thing. Um, is there anything else I left out there? No, thank and, you. And again, I, it's, you know, I've got, I know a little bit about all that stuff, but probably because of what you guys went through, probably not nothing as, as, um, as, as deep depth of knowledge that you guys have. Thank you. And as the new leader, how do you help the school district and community heal and at the same time move forward educationally? And so that, that, I think that, that's one of the things that that's becomes one of those challenges because, um, and again, I, I think that, that my, my personality and, and the characteristics that I have um, help me with that because I'm, I'm such an empath and I'm very empathetic. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, we've still got work to do. And I, when I say we, I'm not talking about officer schools. I'm talking about you know my, the current role that I'm in. I, I get it that 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 life happens, and, and, and I'm going to be empathetic and I'm going to be supportive. But we still have an obligation, responsibility to teach kids, and, and that that can't change. So, um, what I would have to do here is is you know first and foremost, and again, if I can tell you guys. Uh, Something that's uh, you know that's it's a little contradictory. Um, when I read your old stuff and it just stuck with me, uh, my middle son was born November thirtieth. So a a day for me that in my mind is is a joyous day and one that that we celebrate every year. Now for for this community and this school district is is going to be you know like just like when people talk about January sixth. You, you don't necessarily going to have to know all the details. You know, all you need to know is November 30th. And so I think one of the things that, that, that I or whoever's going to have to do is you, you can't come in and it, it can't not be surface. You, you're going to have to spend time um, learning people and knowing people and, and building relationships. And, um, again, one of the things that I pride myself on is, uh, and, and please don't misunderstand this. I, I, at the end of the day, we, we've got to educate kids, but those are still human beings that they're in the classroom educating kids, and, and and I have to understand that that they are, you know, teaching is what they do. It's not necessarily you know who who they are. It's just it, you know what I mean. So I try to get to know those folks on a, on a on a personal level, and um, you know, who, you know who their favorite sports teams are, who their you know who their the names of their children, what sports their children play, what activities their, their kids are involved in, uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, so it would take some time, and I, and I guess that's that's the point I, I'm trying to make here in terms of that developing trust, developing relationships, getting to, to truly understand. I can read, and, and, and i got a pretty good idea of, of the pain that, that, that's taking place, but I'm not going to truly know it until I immerse myself and have conversations with those people and allow those people to be heard. Um, and, and that's, and again, that's just something that, that I'm, I'm good at. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good listener. So talking on the subject of district management, um, what is the level of involvement and participation of certain employees in organizational decisions. How do you determine what groups to include and when? Um, I'm, a, um, I'm a pretty collaborative leader. I try not to leave people out. Um, so that's kind of a, a tricky question because I, I can see where my, my, there might be some stuff that's going on where some other people might not necessarily be involved. But but I have a I have a cabinet, uh, and my cabinet consists of all the directors of, of every department, my assistant superintendent, uh, and we meet one, once a month. And there probably are times where, and the principals are also part of that. But what I try to do is that because the principals get pulled out of their building so much. Unless it's just a have-to thing, I just tell them that they're they're always more than welcome, but they don't have to. But they're still part of the the, the cabinet. Um, but what happens sometimes, Mike, is is that uh, and, and I, again I go back to my teaching days. You know, when I was in in my classroom, 
that, that was my world, and that's, that's what I saw. And I thought that I knew better than other people making these decisions. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, so we're, we're building another school, but you can't, you know, buy textbooks from my school. Until I was in another row, right? So the, the point I'm trying to make here is I bring all those folks together because I want them to understand that, that as a cohesive group, as, as, a, as an organization, that we're all moving uh, toward the same goal. We're all cogs in the wheel. But sometimes we have to understand that, that what we, how what we do impacts what, what happens with another department, if that makes sense. And so uh, that, that, is, that, is, that is my philosophy. Now, there, there probably are times where, well, there definitely are times where um, it, it might be a specific group. So to give you an example, even though I have cabinet, we also have our instructional leadership team. The, the director of food services, director of transportation, director of maintenance, people like that probably don't need to be involved with, you know, all the time. There might be times where they might, might be pulled into that. So there might be times where it's just specific to, to that, that group of folks, you know, if we're looking at, at uh, achievement data or that kind of thing. But then there are, again, there are also times where, let's take, for instance, if we're talking about, because I know you guys have PBIS here, where we're talking about PBIS, and I'm getting complaints from bus drivers that the principal won't do anything, uh, complaints from the principal that the bus drivers won't do anything. And what, what happens is, well, they really don't know what each other's doing. So I got to get them together to see, here's, here's how PBS is working in your building, and you say it's working, it, it's, it's functioning at a high level. Well, how can you share that with the bus garage, the bus drivers, so they can implement that same thing on their bus so that it can, it can work for them as well? And in that way, you guys are working together with the same group of kids as opposed to having this antagonistic relationship. So there are times where, where I have to bring them together. Um, did I answer that question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, thank you. If, if not, we'll... <laughs> If, if not, I'll be glad to come back to come back around. I guess I guess the bottom line is I'm just my philosophy is 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 to, in being collaborative. And again, that's one of those things where that I, a skill that I tried to impress upon my principals is, you know, before you have meetings, you, you communicate something. Think about is there someone else that needs to be included on, on that piece of information? Now, now, what has been the most unpopular or challenging decision that you've had to make, and how would, how did you handle the reaction to that decision, and then what might have you have done differently? Uh, you, you gave me a, a big softball on that one because it's probably one of the, you know that most most districts have to deal with uh, during the pandemic. You, you know, um, mask or no mask, uh, virtual learning, no virtual learning, because it really didn't matter what we decided to do. I was getting my rear end handed to me, you know what I mean? Uh, so, but here's, here's what we did. And just like, and, and let me say this, uh, I want to I praise you guys. Uh, I was happy to, to, to see this uh, because, you know, being a, a district that, or any, any district for that matter, that had to go through a pandemic and had no idea what we were doing, we, we had to pull it together, right? Uh, so we created a pandemic plan. But your all's three-year recovery plan, I think, is, is absolutely awesome and, and amazing and uh, don't know where you got it, whose idea it was, but I think it was great. So, to Mike, to answer, to answer your question, it, it, it comes back to this, and it comes back to what is our mission, what is our, what is our vision, and then I'll put up with the rest of it. So when we created our, our pandemic plan, uh, we, had, we had two objectives. It was very simple, two objectives. The first objective was to, to preserve the health and safety of our students and staff and community. That was the very first one. Secondly, we wanted to educate all kids. And what that meant was, you know, we had some kids who, who did not have uh, devices. We had kids who did not have access to Internet. Uh, so we had to figure out a way to, to get that done if they were going to be virtual learning. Um, obviously, uh, you, know, our, you know, our governor uh, said, you know, we, we had to do virtual learning. So I had lots of people who, you know, accused me of being this side of, of the aisle because I was going along with what the governor said, right? We, we really tried very, very hard to put stuff into place so that we came back the following year. If, if virtual learning is what those kids wanted to do, those families, we allowed it. But we wanted kids to be in school because we felt like connection and, um, and, and being with their teachers, being with their peers was, was important. Uh, and we did all those other mitigating strategies as well. So what happened, Mike, is that's when, you know, people would show up at board meetings and, 
upset with me because you know kids were having to wear masks and, and that kind of thing. And again, how did I handle it? I just came back to this document that was uh, approved by the board our pandemic uh, plan, we called it Restart 2020, and I think we said Restart 2021. Th those were our objectives, and, and I understand that, that you're upset about it, but it's not, it's, it wasn't political. It, it was all about doing what we thought was best for our kids. And on to me. Um, welcome. Over oh, here. there you Sorry. are. <laughs> welcome. Um, uh, my questions are on board superintendent relationships. How do you view the board superintendent relationship? How will you keep board members informed and communicate with us? It's very simple. Uh, superintendent and uh, and board is 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 a, is a marriage. Um, so, what I mean by that is, what 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 my mission and vision are, is 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 what your roles need to be as well. Um, or, or I need to, 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 to adapt to, to yours. Either way, we, we've got to be on the same page. We've got to be moving in, in the same direction. Um, and, and, he, and here's the thing. Um, this has to be a good relationship uh, for, for you guys as, as well as it, it does for, for me in, in, in order for it to, it to work. I think it's that vital uh, because I think, you know, what the community looks at is they, they see me, and you as, as an extension of, of, of the, the schools as, as they should. And so they're going to be looking at, and they, and, the, and they will, they'll be looking at individually, you know, decisions that you make, you know, and they'll be looking to see on, on decisions, are you, are you split, are you unified? Um, and so that's, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's just like, it, in my, in my, Opinion in, in the way that that, that I currently operate, the board is, is is another a cog in the wheel. They might not be in, in daily meetings with with uh, with everyone, but they're they're included in correspondence. I'll, I'll tell you this: that even if if uh, if we have a uh, something as um, I don't know as trivial as as, as a, you know a kid falling down, ambulance coming to to the high school, I, I let my board members know. And let them know what, what's going on, uh, but and I, and I let them know uh, because I don't want you to be blindsided. I don't want to, we want to get ahead of it. We don't want somebody to to make a mountain out of a molehill and get something put something on Facebook. So I let uh, let my board know right away. It's anything that's contentious like that. Um, I'm not going to say that I communicate reg uh, uh, daily with my board, but it's pretty regularly, and the board chair probably you know more more often than, than everyone else, but. Uh, but I, I really try to to not do the the, the group text thing because that could be considered a, you know a, a pseudo meeting. So uh, I, you know, but I do try to keep them in the loop. Like I said, any correspondence that goes out to my staff, the the board gets that as well, because I want the board to see what uh, you know what the communication I'm having with my staff. Uh, when I did a book study with with my staff, it, we did a book study on, on uh, John Gordon book, The Power of a Positive Team. Uh, I also did the same book study with with my board again but but you'd have to understand the, the, the dynamics of, of the district when I where I'm at now where I, when I came to it the divisiveness and, and, and my goal there was to pull everybody together hence uh, the power of a positive team we're, we're all together and uh, I think that worked well so um, I had been very fortunate to um, I have a five member board and uh, I get along with them individually I get along with them collectively um, I value them individually, and I value the expertise that they bring, you know, to to the board. And I will I will say this about you know I guess I'm bragging on my board a little bit here, but um, at the end of the day, that they have the best interest of kids at heart, and so that's why it makes my job easy to work with them. You know where I'm at. Um, you know, then that's some of my parents. So sometimes I have to remind them, okay, you got to take the you got to take the board hat off and put the parent hat on and then you know you have a different conversation right you know yes you're allowed to talk to the principal but make sure it's the parent hat you know that that kind of thing um so th th those would be examples of, of how i've communicated with the board and, and my philosophy on that and, and again that 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 marriage thing that it's got to it's got to be a, it's got to be a good fit you know for, for everybody right for, for this thing to work thank you um and one more for me 
In an effort to achieve what is referred to in other industries as high reliability or just culture, how do you perceive the role of the superintendent in achieving this at Oxford? Can you explain you, what those are? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. So <clears throat> just culture, high reliability is a safety culture, essentially oh, a culture okay. of safety in which anybody can report safety concerns without oh. fear of retaliation. Okay. Um, I'll agree with that. So what was your question again? <laughs> None of us do it either. So um, what do you perceive the role of the superintendent in achieving um, that type of culture? Uh, again, being, being on my part, being open, being transparent, uh, you know, the same thing. If, if, if I see something, I say something. And I, I, I'll tell you, that's easier said than, than done. You know, we, we tell our kids all the time. Um, but I think the other thing is, is hold, holding folks accountable. I mean, something as simple as, um, I, I see like uh, Dr. Is it Rice or Reese? Reese. Reese. You, you have your, your badge on, right? And, uh, you know, if, if um, I have told our, our kids, our students, if you see someone walking around the building and they don't have that on, let someone know. I don't care if, 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 if we do know them. Let someone know, because here's the idea. Yeah, they might know you, but the idea is, if I see somebody walk around that I don't know, that they don't have that on, uh, then I've, I've got to let somebody know. So it's just something as simple as that. But again, we, you know, we, we, uh, we worry about hurting people's feelings and, and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, we're, we're ta again, I go back to our, my, my pandemic plan, you know, to preserve the health and safety of our, of our, you know, our students and staff and community. So, um, I, so again, I, I think me being being open and transparent, and uh, holding folks accountable, making sure that uh, uh, that that whatever whatever measures are in place, that that um, you know we're, we're following those. Um, so like, what, so an, would an example be if 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 a, if a student saw something weird, they could they could report that, and or, or are we talking about staff? Anybody. Oh, okay. So that to create the culture where people feel comfortable in um, and safe reporting. in reporting regardless of what it is it so it doesn't necessarily have to be safety it could be like sexual harassment or something like yeah. that yeah um and again it, it comes that comes down to to building relationships and and letting people know how much they're valued and and, and letting folks know that um you know uh, what's tolerated what's not to, what's not tolerated um I don't know. That's a. I, that's an I, I'm sorry. I, yeah. No, don't be sorry. That's an answer. Do you have any questions for us? You know what? Uh, I do. Um, I have to turn my phone off. On, I mean. My uh, my pen ran out of ink, so I had to put this on on my uh, on the on the plane. All right. Let's see here. I'm sorry to take up some time here. My Apple phone's got there. Right. Okay. All right. So yeah. So re reading reading through here. So again, one of the things that popped up quite a bit, um, financial challenges, and then I think it was a board member maybe that that uh, made the the comment about a challenge that said that trying to develop a a, a five year plan but couldn't do that because of the. Uh, I guess they maybe not been able to look down the road. I don't know. I, so, I, so my question there was, can you can somebody tell me more ab about that, or do you know? <laughs> of course, we know we're the Borg, right? <laughs> um, so we have developed a five-year plan that is a projection that we're perceiving right now, based on some of the grant funding that we know is going to be eliminated at the end of this fiscal year. So, is this a, is this a, a financial plan? Correct. Okay, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, the five-year financial outlook plan. Gotcha, okay. We did a demography study as well that shows um, what anticipated enrollment for seated and virtual kids would look like over the next five years um, based on just some industry trends and other things that are occurring. Um, there are some grants that will be drying up. One is ESSER, which I'm right. sure you're very familiar with ESSER funds. The other is we did get a grant from the tragedy. Mm -hmm. Um, that we use to put a lot of supports in place. And what we need to recognize is how do we continue to have those supports in place, do not eliminate any direct instruction um, without having those revenues coming into the district. Okay. 
that 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 flowed into to my second question because one of the concerns that that your students have, and you guys probably heard this, was the the, the concern that somehow, some way, that these safety measures are are going to eventually go away. So I guess my I was. Because you answered one question, uh, because I was thinking, well, maybe they used extra money to to incorporate some of these, but you, but you got a grant to to do as as well. So, is is that budgeted, or will be budgeted to to maintain those those safety measures that that you currently have in, in place? In our five year outlook, we have maintained all current security okay. measures going into the future. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Um. Is there a particular person that oversees the recovery plan? So we have, it's actually, I, what I would say is, is a joint effort on the ad team, um, because if you looked at the recovery plan, there's different sections, mm -hmm. right? SEL um, has leadership from that, mental health and wellness. We have an executive director of health and wellness. We have a safety and security executive director. Ultimately, it's the superintendent, right, is what right, I would right. say. But there are ad team members that participate in the development, tracking, monitoring, and execution of the items that are in there. Um, and, and so to piggyback on, on that one, and, and this is just a, an, an, an assumption, and forgive me for asking because I, I, I think I would know the, the answer based on what you, what you shared with your five-year plan, but your, your three-year recovery plan ends in 25. So is, is, there, is there a plan to a uh, continuation plan for that or have we not gotten to that point yet so we have we actually have started calling it that I forget how we worded it the ongoing recovery plan because okay. three years meant that signified there would be an end right um, but we're doing it in three-year chunks so uh, 2024 I think was the original end now it's 2025 you know then it'll be 2026 um, because as the students and um, some of the, the objectives will change, right, with the students yeah. changing, because um, we, we have highly impacted students in the building, but we still have impacted families in the district, and mm -hmm. obviously impacted staff that will be with us, hopefully, mm -hmm. through their entire tenure with us. Right. Um, so some of the things may be fluid, um, but it's now the ongoing recovery plan, and I foresee it just being a piece of our fabric um, for a long time. Yeah. Good, good deal. I, I, and, I, and I figured that but I, I thought I, w I would ask again. I'm I'm I'm, I'm very impressed with the with the recovery plan. So th those are you know I've got all kinds of questions, but those those are the main ones. So. Well, great. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to come out tonight um, and visit with us. And um, if you need a good dinner recommendation, one of us will give you one. So as you um, explore the town. Thank uh, you so much. Unfortunately, I've I've got to catch a flight, get back oh. to get back to Kentucky, gotcha. so that I can uh, be in my district tomorrow. Uh, but I, I do I do appreciate the, uh, the, the the time that you you spent with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. you guys have a good evening. Thank you. Six thirty six. We're going to take a recess.
Okay. Okay. You guys ready? All right. Uh, coming back from recess at 6.59 p.m. Uh, moving on to <clears throat> the items uh, 5B on the agenda. Uh, this would be for a selection of finalists. Uh, this would be for individuals to come back uh, next week to tour the district uh, and then do final interviews on April 2nd. So they would be, um, we have three days reserved right now, so we could choose to do three candidates or two candidates. Um, I'm, I don't know if there's a value in bringing the fourth, but I'd be open for board discussion if that is the way that everyone feels. Um, but we can do two or three. Um, we would make a motion with a um, support discussion and then a roll call vote to determine if we are going to bring um, those individuals back for the next round. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. If someone wants to make the first motion on a candidate they would like to bring back, I would take that now. Uh, Heather. Move to select Cormac Lynn for final interview. Do I have a support? Amanda? And then discussion. Um, well, since since I offered to to motion it, I'll I'll talk a little bit. I thought he was. Um, he, I, I have a couple notes. He talked a lot about it, it. It's a marathon and not a sprint. He talked a lot about building collaboration. Um, he talked. He talked about his own learning curve coming out of the private sector into the public sector, which will be a challenge. Um, but I think that it's one he's willing to embrace and talked about wanting to embrace. So I think that's important too, is to what, you know, everybody wants to be challenged in their job and it's a good thing to want things and to, and to want different things in your professional development. And so that's why I feel he should move on to the next round. Go ahead. I'd like to agree with that. Uh, some things that I, I noted about Cormac. It was a small detail, but it was pretty insightful as to his leadership style when he sat down and acknowledged not only the audience here, but the audience at home on camera. I just thought that that, that was indicative of, of his leadership style. Uh, his intentional communication, I love that his communication style, including the vacuum proactively, as he put it, mm -hmm. and understanding how that goes his reliance on teachers and other staff who are with the kids to define student success, his experience with policy advocacy, grants, safety partnerships. Uh, he mentioned the uncapitalized potential of collaborating with teachers and staff and emphasized clear policies, following them, having clear definitions, reducing the gray area he mentioned. Uh, I think that it will be a learning curve switching from private to public, but however, that fresh perspective can sometimes be a good thing. So those were those were my thoughts on Cormac. Mary? Thank you. Um, I am not in favor of moving him forward because I'm really concerned with not having any public school experience. Um, it's public school and parochial schools are very, very different with the funding they get, the students they serve, the services they provide, um, as well as the, um, the things that we're lobbying for um, to Congress sometime is different. Um, also, I just, I'm, I'm really concerned that that is a, is a larger learning curve than is healthy for Oxford. Go ahead, Kelly. Um, I think that anybody who comes to Oxford is going to have a learning curve um, because of our situation and um, just, you know, just because we're Oxford. Um, what I did like about Cormac, I have a few notes, but one of the things I liked is the way he answered the questions. So he answered the question and then he explained his answer and then he gave us a couple of examples. And, and he was pretty... Um, um, consistent with that time and time again. Um, and I thought of all the candidates yesterday or, or uh, so far, he gave the, it was obvious to me that he was a superintendent because he gave some very specific answers. And although he comes from the private sector, he clearly has managed buildings and budgets and made tough decisions. So I would support him. 
I, I would echo some of Mary's concerns. Making the transition from a parochial school um, to a public school is, is will be different, um, difficult. It'll be a, a huge climb, I do believe. Um, there were a couple comments that um, I think threw up red flags, one of them being if, if this is a not, not a right place for your student, um, then maybe we would help them find a different place, and that is just not optional in public schools. This is this is the public school that serves uh, the greater Oxford community, and um, <clears throat> if there's a student having challenges here, we have to find a way to amend to that student, not to um, maybe help shepherd them on to a different environment. Although maybe you know virtual school is what he was referring to at that point, but um, I did like some of the statements he made about you know culture. I think he has favorable questions um, of mm -hmm. the board um, out of all the, uh, the candidates, too. Um, I just think there are some probably preconceived things that um, happen in parochial schools that certainly do not happen in public schools. And I think um, we have a big journey uh, continuing ahead of us. Um, and I, I worry about that transition taking more time um, away from his ability to do effective work um, versus um, someone who is already familiar with some of the, the, the foundational aspects of public schools. Um, that, that learning curve on top of learning our culture, all of the things that we have, um, you know, can, it can be a barrier to getting success in a, in a time frame that maybe we might be expecting someone to have. So those would be my comments. Um, Michael I mean, James? I, from, from a, I guess, a professional standpoint, I, I did grade him high, um, but I, I, do, I do have concerns with, certainly there's going to be a learning curve for, for anybody that comes here, right? Um, but uh, I, I, I agree that his, his learning curve would be different, and, um, and I think, I, I mean, kind of echo Aaron, is we're expecting somebody to kind of hit the ground running, and he's going to have to spool up just to understand, you know, public schools alone. I, do, I mean, I, I, like I said, I graded him high. He was, he was uh, in my top three, but, uh, but I do have concerns. Yeah, I don't disagree with you on that. I, um, you know, so coming from the private sector and stuff, I, I, when, he, when he talked about reaching out to legislators and looking at, maybe non-traditional ways for funding. And uh, I, was, I, I appreciate the taking an initiative to look for things for the, the financial shortcomings on the private sector, right? Budgeting and where they get their money from is a bit different than public schools. You know, when he first opened up, he started talking about KPIs he put in there around financing. You know, looking that we have a, a five-year plan and, and we're, we're going into a shortfall, I think we'll leverage some of that, maybe some non-traditional ways of looking at funding and stuff. The other thing that I, I really... I was impressed, you know, he went through and, and read the comments that people said, and from there he deduced the questions of, you know, it feels like there's a sense of a divide in the community and looking to understand that more. And then obviously he talked about the financial questions. So even coming from the private side, he's, you know, coming into the interview, he's done some research and looked at what we've put and what the community has brought together and stuff. And and so I think he's cognitive of what, what it may be, but, you know, I, everybody here, uh, nobody's going to be able to, once they take that seat, know fully what w what it is that, that's going on here. I mean, it, until you're, you're here all the time and stuff. So I, I, um, I try not to judge people on that just because they're all from outside. Some are local, but some are, are further away. But um, his, his looking into it and stuff um, and, and bringing up those questions, I, I was impressed by that and, and like that. All right. Well, we'll do a roll call vote. Majority um, <clears throat> will get uh, the candidate to come at least for the tours and the final interview. So, okay. So, roll call vote. Uh, Hanser? No. Uh, McDonough? Yes. Uh, Schultz? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Summers? Yes. And then Whitney? Yes. And then Dr. Reese? All votes need to be recorded, whether it's for it should. Yeah. They all she, votes she, need to be recorded. Yeah. She, I'm very she, aware. Oh. She's doing it. Yeah. Um, a vote. A vote. Yes. Okay. I bring him for the next round. Yep.
All right. Does someone and that, want to motion? That's what we're, me, that's what we're doing, right? Is yeah. This that's is for the next. This is an okay. for the next round. Correct. To bring in for the on-site. Yeah. Okay. Yep. No, I, I, yeah, I wasn't questioning you. I thought you had said, "Does it matter?" Um, oh. No. No. Oh, I can. Yeah. So I was just right. answering you. Aaron, Sorry. The, mo the motion is not quite correct. Then look at the wording on the motion. If we're, because we're talking about. Move to select the. Yes. Okay, the final I'm interview. Just you. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Bring one in another direction. Okay. Okay. Nope, you're fine. Mary? I'm ready for you to make a motion, Mary. Uh, move to select David Rowley for final interview. All right, with Mike. Uh, thank you. I will uh, lead with I. Um, he has done the work of a superintendent. He's fully aware of what it takes to be a superintendent. I appreciate his reliance on the systems, um, his reliance on the policy. The question is, is you know, did you follow the policy? Um, and the willingness to um, learn and that we all have, um, that, that we all will work to, together better. I really appreciate his focus on individuals, his focus on each student, his focus on each and every person, and words like dignity and treating people with dignity um, and treating people like they matter because they do matter. Um, I think that was really important. Um, he was very um, straightforward um, with the way that um, he handles different concerns because it's it's not personal. We're looking out for the interest of each and every student and staff member in this district. Um, so I think he would be a very strong candidate. Go ahead. I, I agree with Mary. Um, I think he was he was extremely warm, um, great personality, which is important. They have to get along with a lot of people and uh, great personality. A um, couple things he mentioned that I really liked, people before paper. Um, I know that's hard to do when you're a superintendent. You have a lot to keep moving. Um, the, the budget and curriculum, you know, you, are, you have to get that paper moving, but you also have to um, get your administration, your cabinet, and your staff on board. And uh, I really liked that people before paper comment. He also talked a lot about creating a two-way communication being visible, approachable, um, empathetic. Those are all great attributes for a good superintendent, good human being, but a good superintendent. And um, I also like that he, his referrals to policy, you know, always counting, falling back on the policy. Um, that, that was great to hear too. Um, so those are my thoughts. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that because that also stood out to me, his reliance on policy. Like he mentioned, not just checking the box, but adhering to policies. I liked his communication style and keeping the board apprised of any incidents. Uh, the leadership plan that he brought was excellent. I thought that was a, a wonderful touch, and it is really full of a lot of great things. He he specifically references our legislators. He, he really took the time on this, and it shows. And I loved the example he used of the new building and the teacher going, but I need textbooks. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great way to pull it together and recognize how wide decisions are felt across the district. Um, I think that the McDonald's story was, was also great, gave a good insight into who he is as a person. Mm -hmm. And then, as always, my uh, concerns. The two things that I, I am slightly concerned about are the end of his career, where he's at in that journey and also getting up to speed on the differences from Kentucky to Michigan. So again, not huge concerns, but just noting them. I, it, so it, it's funny because like going into it, you know, when, when we're looking at the stuff and, and getting prepared today, I was, I was concerned with that, like the, you know, potential significant differences, right, from Kentucky to Michigan um, and stuff. But I think coming in today and seeing this leadership transition plan, I mean, he calls out his shortcomings in here of what he doesn't have and what he sees that we're looking for. Um, and, and the one thing, you know, like scheduling time to get up to speed on training, you know, the, the trauma informed part in there. Um, and then 
again, the two-way communication, I think, is important because he, he started with, you know, it's easy to be there as, as a superintendent just putting it out, but you got to build that two-way, and so it goes back and forth. Um, and then I like his, you know, being visible, being approachable, and being accountable. Those are those are three things that, you know, I, I think are, are paramount of what we need, you know, the visibility, being able to be approachable, and then being held accountable for what we do. Mm -hmm. Kind of, I'm going to act a little part. I mean, knowing, I had concerns with bringing somebody from out of state, but knowing the research that he's already done, and I, I mean, just talking to it, not just something he put on, on paper, right? He was able to talk to many, I mean, I guess, dynamics that we're dealing with, programs that we're even dealing with, and things of that nature. I don't know that the learning curve would be that much. Certainly, there's going to be changes, right? There's going to be differences where the... And, um, but I, I, I did, I, I graded him very high. Well, and that was, we talked a lot about casting our net very wide when we were looking at search firms. That's one of the reasons why we looked at search firms outside of just using MLI or MASB. We wanted a big net. So um, a, a professional can get, is it, going to have a ramp up time and be able to handle and manage that effectively, I think. I think so. The right leader, without a problem. I think I'll echo some of Amanda's concerns. Um, again, I'll echo the strengths too. I think, you know, being a, a tenured superintendent has its positives, right? You, you know what you're stepping into as a superintendent and you know, you know the job that you're gonna do <clears throat> when you get here and the research that he did, you know, looking at some of our achievement data already. Um, aside from him, you know, reaching tenure in Kentucky and retiring and looking for other spots, um, I, I did like the statement, though, he, he's a, a capacity builder for those. Mm -hmm. So even um, if he were to come, it was not relatively in vain. It would be to build capacity within our own leadership team here at the district. Um, but one of the statements, he's, we talked about some of the biggest challenges for students is um, I, I felt like although he did reference it in different parts of the leadership plan and throughout the thing, he, he didn't talk about how the tragedy has affected our achievement scores. Um, which is a very obvious explanation for why we have downward trends in some of our student populations, not because our teachers or administration haven't been trying. Um, we have um, kids that are recovering still and teachers that are recovering still. And I think um, that was a very obvious, easy answer that almost everyone else was able to hit right away, that we needed to balance our mental, emotional, and social learning with our academic learning and talk about growth versus achievement um, by state standards. Um, so that <clears throat> that would be my concern also with, you know, the, the transition to Michigan and some of the law differences, the language differences, bargaining agreement differences that we have uh, here. Um, however, being a superintendent, I feel like those are probably transferable skills um, that he could potentially uh, gather quite quickly, a little bit uh, quicker than I think someone coming from a private sector school. So, all right. Roll call vote. Yep. Uh, McDonough? Yes. Schultz? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Summers? Yes. Whitney? Yes. Uh, Hanser? Yes. And Reese? Yes. All right. Did you have a motion? I do. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, move to select Tanya Milligan for final interview. Do I have a support? Mike? All right. Amanda, you want to oh, start? Yep, I'll start. So some things I really liked about Tanya, uh, she has a long history of researching and then implementing trauma-informed care. She mentioned fostering a culture of belonging. She described herself as overly transparent, a server leader, servant leader, excuse me, and very collaborative. Uh, she understands the importance of mental health, both personally and professionally. She appreciates public comments, creates opportunities for more communication, and has an in-it-together philosophy. I did also like that the HYA consultant specifically referred her and her student-centered focus. She seems to have a pretty good grasp and understands and recognizes the challenges faced by our students, staff, and parents after the shooting. and. I like how her philosophy on improving culture is by doing what you say, maintaining account accountability and systems. 
and uh, her focus on policy management. And the concern I had with her is her statement on paperwork not being her, her forte. I completely, you know, understand that. Uh, but it is really important, especially when overseeing grants, state guidelines, things that, that the superintendent is responsible for. So all in all, I, I liked Tanya very much as a candidate. Go ahead. Um, I agree. I liked her as a candidate also. Um, I think a little bit, some of her answers were a little general. Um, however, she had some very specific mentions. Restorative practice, she talked about Beauty and the Beast. Um, she talked about watching our board meetings. Um, I really liked that she said her servant, lead, she was a servant leader. That's a, a big tell to me. Um, I think she was very likable. She was an easy talker. Um, and I, my concern is um, that she's not been in central office for very long. I, I guess my concern is that she's not been in central office very long, and she's also been in a really big district. And my experience has been with administrators sometimes that are in really big districts. They have a lot of staff that do all the work. And when you get here, there's not a lot of staff to do all the work. You have to do the work. So those would be my two concerns. I, you know, what she's talking about where she's currently at and the diversity within the community as well as the the, the pain points that they have there between um, gun violence in the community, student suicide, and, and understanding and, and dealing with, you know, trauma-informed care, but, you know, crisis management stuff. I think those, if chosen finally for it, you know, those, those skills and that experience in there and understanding a bit more, I think, puts her above the rest of the candidates, um, in my eyes, especially um, as, as Oxford continues to grow and, and we're looking at, at, you know, hopefully more people coming into the district and stuff, having, having experience with people from all walks of life, I think is definitely beneficial. The, the other part that stuck out too is uh, a couple of her phrases, she said that she's not the keeper of knowledge um, and that she works with the teams and she doesn't mind um, constructive, she didn't say constructive criticism or, or feedback, but willing to hear other people's point of views before making an informed decision. I think that's important with our, our cabinet and our, and our board as well as, you know, hearing from the community at, at large. I can go ahead and make my comments now too. Um, I think some of the, the positives about her, she talked about growth, um, student growth, and that is also achievement, even though it may have a different definition to certain people. Um, student focused. She talked a lot about modeling expectations. Um, so you live it and you model it so that way other folks live it and model it as well. Um, and then she's data driven um, and then her focus on ensuring that the whole child is cared for and a lot of um, discussion she had around uh, ensuring that academic success and um, social and emotional wellness is also extremely important to her. Um, and how it's balanced. My, my concern would echo the same as David's, that she's coming from another state, um, and also Colleen's, that her central office experience um, <clears throat> at the superintendent level is limited, um, and therefore um, that will be some growth, um, foundational growth that she will need to achieve as well. So. All right, Mike, anything? Heather? Um. I, I did have a couple notes on her as well. I did, I think, thought she was very warm also and personable. Um, I also liked that she talked about um, IB student achievement data and things along those lines um, and who is being successful and who is not. Looking at um, a data-driven kind of decisions. Um, she talked a lot about working with partners. I, I would assume you know, with her experience at her school, she works with a lot of outside agencies mm -hmm. to provide supports. Um, so, sh which, you know, we currently are working with a lot of outside agencies. We haven't always in the past as much as we are now, but um, so she would have um, definitely an understanding of how that works. Um, so, yeah. 
Roll call vote, James. Yep. Uh, just one last comment. And the one part that I, I wanted to mention too is that I looked at her. So she says, you know, looking for high standards for the challenges of student achievement, but then the key phrase that I picked up on a, you know, but that's also going to probably include wraparound services for the mental health and well-being and stuff, and, and meeting people where they're at to get them to those high standards. So that's the last thing I would say. Mm -hmm. she used that word a lot, didn't she? Yep. All right, roll call vote. Uh, Schultz? Yes. Uh, Schaefer? Yes. Summers? Yes. Whitney? Yes. Uh, Hanser? Yes. McDonough? Yes. And Reese? Yes. Okay. Okay, that being said, that is uh, three candidates. I just wanted to make sure before we close out if there was a desire for a fourth. We don't have a fourth day scheduled. Angela might come over here and be mad at us, but we'd make it work if there was strong feeling one way or another. All right, three is it? Okay, uh, item number six on the agenda is unscheduled public comment. Mark Gillum. Uh, if it's not, there's a button right in the... Is, is the light green? Check, all right. So I think any of these candidates could be considered um, a step up from where we're at. Um, I have my opinions. Um, my number one concern is Cormacklin. You guys seem to think he's great. My concern is he only has experience in a religious background, in one religion. Uh, I don't think that's the way to go. I don't think we're looking for a religious leader, somebody who's been indoctrinated into one specific mindset. He has no experience with inclusion or public schools, and specifically the organization all his background is in specifically forbids women from leadership and has a terrible history of child sexual abuse against children between 2000, uh, let's see, between 1915 and 2020, uh, over 330,000 children in that religious organization were sexually abused and they have paid out over $4 billion in claims and settlements against those um, crimes against our children. So to bring somebody who's rooted in that, uh, I think it puts our community um, in a very vulnerable situation. So he is a security risk. Um, you consider David from Kentucky. Um, I think he's a very gentle, kind man with a lot of great experience. Uh, I just want to make sure he leaves his Confederate flag at home along with his ideals of fighting for slavery and make sure that that's not something he brings up here to the north. So we have almost a dozen open lawsuits against Oxford Community Schools, a trial motion for the shooter's father and individuals associated with the November 30, 30th leadership failures who allowed the tragedy to happen still with our school, including employees that could have prevented the tragedy but chose not to do a threat assessment on the shooter. I don't believe the divide in our community has anything to do with a new cycle or where people are at in their healing journey. It has to do with the wrongful death and murders of Hannah St. Juliana, Madison Baldwin, Justin Schilling, and Tate Muir, and this community establishing justice for all victims and survivors by holding those who failed accountable like Mary Hanser and Heather Schaefer, along with the other 30th, November 30th board members and staff who did not protect our children as they were hired and paid to do. Um, on March 21st, board meeting agendas should include uh, agenda items to censure Mary and Heather for their failures as defined in the $3 million investigation and coordinate with Governor Gretchen Whitmer for their removal. And also, number two, to immediately terminate employment of Stephen Wolf, Pam Fine, and Jim Rourke for their failures to, leading to the death of our students, also defined in our $3 million report. We're dealing with a trauma response avoidance that is only driving pain and division deeper into this community. These issues should be resolved in accordance with board powers as defined in the Oxford Community School Bylaws, Section 0122 and Item D, hiring or terminating employees. Why Thank is you. this board abdicating your responsibility to a superintendent? Item number seven on the agenda are scheduled activities. We do have a conversations over coffee tomorrow. Um, so Mike is going to be there. I'll be there. If someone else would like to come. You're welcome to come. We have yeah, room one. Oh, and Heather. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. What school is that? Danielle Axford. Oh, yeah. 
Yep. Um, all right. <clears throat> Number eight on the agenda is closed session. Um, if someone would like to make the motion for that, Colleen. Sure thing. Move to meet in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, Section 8C, to consult with attorney regarding case strategy in connection with specific pending litig litigation. Oakland County Circuit Court case number 24-204-988-CK. Do I have support? Mike? Any discussion? Roll call vote. Uh, Hanser? Yes. Uh, McDonough? Yes. Uh, Schultz? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Summers? Yes. Whitney? Yes. And Dr. Reese? Yes. All right. 729, go into closed session.
All right. Uh, returning from closed session, it's 820. Uh, do we have any final board comments? One thing. Sure. Um, I just wanted to congratulate the board. What we did tonight was a lot of hard work. You know, as I've told you before, this is my third time doing this, and it, it takes a lot to get to this point, and so well done. I agree. Well done. This is the most important thing a sitting board can do is to hire on a, a superintendent. Right. I thought we did a good job. All right. Great. Meeting adjourned.